Um, I, I want to go back and get this info. List down aspects of what we've learned about the characters and about the setting uh, that will take uh, hooks from the characters, right? Your players, if your players are invested in their characters, then we're taking the natural, uh, not even the hooks, like the, so they have the eyes and we have the hooks, uh, and whoop, real. Uh, and, and so we want to be able to draw our characters into our story, and then we want to marry them to the setting that we developed as a DM. And of course, the setting is uh, is beyond the player's control unless you had that conversation with your players of saying, um, uh, uh, hey, Daly, welcome. Uh, it, you know, unless you, you had, well, you know, do you want to play in some place unique? Do you want like a, an Arabian adventure? Do you want an Arctic adventure? Do you want a Western European adventure? Uh, do you want an Oriental adventure uh, as, the, as the books were called? Um, that was actually back when uh, Oriental Adventures was a third edition supplement uh, that took Rokugan, which was uh, Legend of the Five Rings, and that was printed under Wizards. Fun fact, I think I still have my Oriental Adventures third edition handbook around. It was really cool. Uh, I I don't know if it's up here. It's probably downstairs in my, in my role-playing area. Yeah not immediately available <laughs> uh, so yeah unless you sat down with your your pcs before or not your pcs with your players beforehand and flesh it out then this is going to be brand new wide-eyed adventure they probably were never expecting the concept that we came up with right this this arctic swamp this this very literal bubbling burbling humid uh you know swamp in the middle of like a siberian uh landscape uh, arctic antarctic landscape um, so we're, we're going to be able to, to take the info from your characters and, uh, give them reason to be here. And we're going to do so by referencing the Dungeon Master's Guide. So, class, I expect you have your books here by now. Come on. J-Man was having a great rant about survivalists. Oh, like, uh, off, off the grid kind of in a woods, uh, people or... Um, are, are we talking like Bear grills, like extreme camping? J-Man is full of very good rants, by the way. <laughs> also, Dark Wolf, I hope that you, uh, that you had a good campaign session today. I know that you said Lost Mine of Fandelver is going to be winding down here shortly if it hasn't already. Uh, looked like you were having a lot of fun when I popped in to pick up a couple things tonight. Oh shoot! I forgot to. After the break, I'll bring in. I'll bring in what I have. Uh, what I ended up getting in, and I'm not talking about my manga. <laughs> that I have a. I have a library for in my house here. It is called that. It's called the library. <laughs> And of course, even behind me on the green screen, I have uh, I have shelves of uh, books, not just manga, but you know, novels and references and art books and all this other stuff. He was comparing people who live out in the wild and don't need anything to people who bring a bunch of stuff with them to do the same thing. Oh, okay. So you have you have uh, someone who will say, "Hey, I'm a camper," and they will bring an RV with electricity, uh, you know, an onboard toilet. Uh, TVs because they're they're in an RV uh, camping, and the closest thing to a tent is like the awning that kind of folds out the side. Then you have a camper uh, who will still bring you know like torches and and, and or, I mean like uh not like torches uh like fire. I guess it'd be the the British torch like a, a flashlight or an electric lamp and you know a little mini propane and whatever. And then they're they're camping because they're in a tent, uh, but they have these other things. And then you have campers. Who are the the Bear Grylls style survivalists of? No, if I camp, I'm building my own lean-to. <laughs> I'm gonna rub sticks together and get fire. That's camping. Hey, Mr. Flump. Daily says I was to open my book, but they are not here yet. Uh, which one are you referring to, Daily?
Also, is the background music okay? Is that a good volume? Like that with a lot more cursing. Well, and I say this with all due affection, it is J-Man. <laughs> music volume is perfect. Okay, good. I want to make sure that my own voice isn't drowned out. Um, again, I've been playing with the position of the microphone, which is like just off camera. Actually, hang on. Yep. So that's about, uh, ooh, okay. I could bring it in a little bit more if that'll help, if that'll help with the volume a bit. Might make for a little better uh, ASMR when I have it too, right? <laughs> Just so close to the core rule set they'd ordered uh, and Friday's Ravnica and Mad Mage. I want all the books, all the books. Yeah, uh, and you know what? Uh, they're, um, Friday is Ravnica, and I'm gonna have to see what's, uh, what's happening here. Uh, I heard, uh, I heard that, uh, our, one of our main distributors here, uh, might have, uh, flubbed an order. And I need to talk with, uh, I need to talk with, uh, someone back at the shop tomorrow. Uh, even before I go down and run, I'll, I'm gonna be making a side trip in the morning to go down and find out what's happening. Uh, because I, I heard that there was uh, some kind of an error or something along those lines. Uh, which apparently also resulted prior in uh, us receiving 40 copies of uh, Agricola instead of three. 40 copies of Agricola instead of three. And um, it's uh, kind of a fight to get them to take it back. So, Daly, if you understand, uh, when, when we were talking about getting those gift sets in, um, I know that the orders are in. Uh, that's why sometimes I'm, uh, I'm hesitant, because despite us, this, is one of the, th this isn't some little podunk distributor either that I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but this is, this is a major distributor, and, uh, and stuff like this happens. And I, ooh, getting into comic books. Oh, this is excellent, by the way. Um, so, next week... Not this week, next week. Um, I will be... I'll be inviting you to come behind the counter. Maybe that's what I'll call it, behind the counter. And I will be discussing, uh, you know, business. What's it like to run, own, or be a part of a, uh, a friendly local game store or a comic store or something along those lines? And I will have a couple guests who are going to... Uh, drop in by voice and uh, maybe video and we're going to chat about their own experiences as well and it's a good time for you to ask questions um, you know if you want to know what it's like if you want to know the ups downs and all arounds next week is going to be that opportunity hey Nadpoo, welcome yeah uh, Flump those uh, those uh, those special game store only collector's editions um Uh, Daily, it was a board game called Agricola. It's an awesome game. I love the game. But when you when you look for three of them in your store and you get 40 of them, uh, there's a problem. Party just finished the last battle of the mod. Thankfully, we were able to stay until 8.30 because of the magic players. Gotcha. <laughs> so I'm going to see what's happening with... Because uh, I... When I heard about this stuff, I, I, it makes me so super clench up because uh, because of those collector editions, because of Ravnica coming in. Um, I'm supposed to run the Ravnica, like the intro mod, on Saturday at the store. And if we're facing an oopsie doodle from the distributor, uh, well... Right? This is why we're going to have the shows we're going to have next week. What do you do? As a, as a business owner, as someone who works in a community, and especially as someone uh, who sells, uh, at, at times, very high-dollar uh, collector material, uh, let alone things that are sentimental to people uh, and carry great sentimental value, let alone uh, monetary value, and something happens, whether it's good or bad.
Yeah, they're amazing. I can't in good conscience buy the set again since I already got them. Uh, but I'd be sure to be able to swap them if I could. Well, Est Wild, uh, something you can do if you were interested in getting the new collectors, um, you know, from your own friendly local game store. I mean, I'll always say I can let me help you as well if you don't already have a local small business to support. Um, you could probably donate if they're in good condition. You can donate your old rule books to a library next to you or close to you. Uh, or, you know, donate them to a school or, you know, to if there's a local RP club uh, at, a, at a community college or a college near you. You can donate your old uh, good condition books there or I guess even to Goodwill if you wanted. And that way you know they're going to be used and find good homes and then you could get the, the new and improved books uh, from, your, from your own local small business if you wanted. Uh, yes, I do remember HeroQuest Nadfu. That's the idea, Dark Wolf, but um, I need to have a conversation, I think, with a couple people tomorrow. Um, and one of those is going to be in involving uh, on the phone, I believe, um, with a, a sales rep and, and checking on something here. <laughs> Daily, I understand. And, and believe me, I'm not saying this to make you pucker up either. Um... I think I think this is more about the specific Ravnica. Uh, this is more about the specific Ravnica stuff than anything else. Hero Quest is what got you hooked into the whole genre. We we all have something that got us in Nadfu. Hey JT, I burnt it all and uh, burn it all and become a drifter. Says Japan Texas. <laughs> Is a zero out of ten. Excellent, my friend. Um, uh, for those of you, by the way, uh, JT and others, uh, you should have your minis out. I, they, they should be out sometime this week here. Uh, so bear with me on this as well. Um, they're at the store, and they, they should be just about ready to go out here. Keep me posted. Am I trying to make it with my sis and friend? Yes, I will, Dark Wolf. Uh, you know that we have our, our own tag now on our Discord server for those of you uh, who play D&D &D at the store. Um, if, uh, I know Kitty on Paper is on there, but, I mean, I know she has a name on our Discord server, I don't know how often she's actually on. But if your friend is a part of it too, you can encourage her to get on, and then she can be given that tag as well. You got to experience your first character death since starting on Roll20. Rest in peace, Monroe Monry. Oh, well, uh, here, I will, I will, uh, press F to pay respects. And you're welcome to share that story, too, as we're going through things, uh, Nadfu. Okay, well, uh, so <laughs> we had our intro table talk, uh, as well as me showing a little bit of ankle for what we're going to be doing next week. Uh, as we are going to, uh, to delve into uh, what is behind the counter of uh, your friendly local game store. Um, oh, yeah, there we go, Daily Cheers, right? <laughs> oh, and you, you put the screenshot in Discord? Gotcha, S Wild. You don't know if she uses it, though? Well, if she is, get her name and we can tag her in on it just in case. Alright, so let's let's minimize this. Let, let's get this out of the way here, right? We want we want our character sheet notes. This is going to be the first part of our of our beginning of the week workshop. When you go through and create a character, whether it's completely randomly or if it is something that you're doing deliberately, I would imagine your your player I, we're approaching this as DMs by the way. Your player should have an idea about what he or she wants from the character. Um and that might not even be expressed on the paper. But especially with the background system of 5th edition here, right? You have your two personality traits, an ideal, a bond, and a flaw. This is very fertile ground for you to sow the seeds of your campaign and uh, and reap the, reap the rewards from it. Because not only do these things act as, uh, as like... Uh, uh, boundaries, sort of like guidelines, 
uh, in which your characters will bounce around and, and operate within, and sometimes without, hopefully not too often, depending on uh, circumstances. But this is a way for you as a DM to take that playpen, or I, so we'll reference uh, kind of an old, uh, uh, I, I, I say old, this channel isn't even a year old yet, um, but uh, you know, uh, Dark Wolf is the queen of a place called Kitty Pendia. Uh, it is the kid's pen where all of the other evil forces are fighting, marching armies, trying to take over the world. And honestly, she just wants to color and drink from juice boxes and give people uh, lunches. So, <laughs> um, and, and so we want to take these play pens. Oh, hey! Two for me, two for erupted. Sounds fun. We can open them when you want. I know we are just getting going. Oh, hey! Well, thank you very much. Then yes. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll put a notification up that we'll have a raffle. Uh, tell me, though, Daily, as you're going to get first dibs. I have four boxes of Monster Menagerie 1, and I have four boxes of Monster Menagerie 2 currently with me. There's a couple boxes that are still on the wall at the store, but I, I brought home four and four of each tonight. Which two do you want? And then for the raffle, wh whichever two are left over, um, the winners can choose. What's my opinion on characters having two ideals? Uh, you want one of each? Okay. Uh, so daily, I will. I, I guess we'll we'll just uh, I'll hold these off to the side for you. And then for the others, whoop! <laughs> I still got to take the price sticker off. Uh, for the others, when we do the raffle. Uh, they can then choose, like, if we want two MM2s, actually, in order to keep things true to cycling. Ah, there we go. Gotcha. So, that one's yours, Flump. And then this is the last MM2 that I currently have that I currently have with me. Well, the price sticker's still on there, but it looks like uh, it looks like the snake's head's kind of getting in the way here. So, Daily, yours are down to the side, and and, uh, and we'll pop those right before we do the raffle to build a little bit of excitement. And, uh, Flump, uh, I can pop yours as we're going through narration and going through things here. And, uh, yeah, ideals are uh, fodder for improved role-playing to inspire. I do agree with that, Flump. I would be very careful, Jericho. If you start listing a uh, if you start listing a bunch of details, it can bog you down, and and it can really confine you uh, into uh, into either uh, becoming so obsessed with your character sheet you're not thinking about other things because you have to cycle through all your bullet points, or you're going to forget about these other details that you went out of the way to include because sit the situation on the ground or rather on the vinyl is, um, is happening. And it is, um, and, uh, and so all of a sudden you have these two ideals, uh, or three ideals and you can't really meet them because in a communal storytelling session, maybe the spotlight isn't always on you to either make the decision or to express your opinion in that fashion. Um, so, I'm a bit of a minimalist. I would say in this case, less is more. Um, you know, set set a direction. North isn't just a straight and narrow line. North is a big old wedge that goes out to the horizon in front of you. So, I would set a point and use that as a focus, but you can kind of wiggle your way back and forth as you're still arriving towards that. And then, of course, over the, cor uh, over, over the course of the campaign... Your ideal might change. You can start out as a happy, optimistic, you know, yeah, I'm young and full of energy and I'm going to save the world because that's what we do in anime. I'm, I'm you know, tongue in cheek here. And, um, uh, and then, you know, at the halfway mark of your, of your module or your, uh, or your campaign or whatever, uh, you've seen some stuff. And maybe you've lost faith in humanity, and all of a sudden, your ideal has completely shifted to, or uh, from, I want to protect people, 
and you know everything is is rainbows and babies and and you know it's eternal summertime too is the world even worth saving i'm actually considering what the villain is talking about i i, I mean i i get it i've seen it in front of me i never thought I'd, I'd be this way but now my ideal is more like i need to wake people up you know and you, you could be you could be aggressive about it or you could be uh, just sort of like on on the on the down low about it and operating from the shadows. So if if you have a bunch of details on your character sheet, uh, it can it might be able to it might stagnate or hold back your character because you're anchored to uh, too uh, to too many bullet points. If that makes sense. You knocked out three players and the cat. <laughs> All right, Flump, let's take a look at what you got here real quick. We are not in Dragon Heist. We are in Monster Menagerie 2. We are going to begin with a Halfling Rogue. A Halfling Rogue. Next up, I guess, are we going straight to Uncommons? I believe so. Yes, we are. A hobgoblin with a helmet and two swords. A hobgoblin with a helmet and two... S I, I swear they're there. Come on, camera. There we are. Hey, Zeta! Welcome! I hope your Zelda campaign has been going well. Uh, next up, we have a... Wrong way. Wrong way. Here we go. A warg. Rawr. Oh, woo. They're not quite like wolves, but they are, but they're not. And then lastly, but not leastly, uh, we have... A Mind Flayer with a Claw. Mind Flayer with a Claw. So let me know which one you want out of there, uh, Trust the Flump. Forsaken, I have... Um, Monster Menagerie 2 has dragons in it, and at the store, if it's still there, I can, I have, when I left the store last night, I had one box of Tyranny of Dragons left that could have dragons in it. Oh, cool. Yeah, hey, you know, I've, you've been playing through it, you've been doing this live play testing with your group, um, and so I, I do hope that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get some uh, positive feedback on it as well. Um, or some, you know, constructive feedback, too, if there's something... Because, look, there's always something that needs tweaking. But, uh, yeah, if, if you want to even... If you want to open that up to the community as well, Zeta, um, I know I'll, I'll take a look through it. You got to get the flayer? All right, one a lithid for the flump. Do it for the flump. The Flumpmeister, the Flumpharama, the Flumpinator. Trust the Flump. Flumpharama. If any of you know that reference, by the way. Haha, ha, you're as old as me. Meh. <laughs> I guess technically I mean the the raffle will come and it'll be two boxes Daly has his set aside so uh, there are still I guess these two boxes of Monster Menagerie 2 that are left uh, if, if you wanted to sponsor them as well because uh, the raffle will be what I have left and I'll make sure at, at a minimum I have two because uh, two slots were held aside 
Um, Zeta, if you want to put it in uh, the workshop, that'd be good. Goody's reference or older? Uh, it's about the same era, Nadpoo. That's right, Daily. Yes, I am, and I'm actually over over here making copies. The Daily Stir. Daily Ramma. Daily Ellie Ding Dong. The Daily. Daily Man. Making copies. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, so, hey, Forsaken, sure. Uh, let me know which box you'd like then. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so as we were, um, as we were going through, um, our character sheets as a, as a PC, we're getting inspiration, right? We're getting our ideals that we're talking about. As a DM, ask your, ask your, P uh, well, I'd say your PCs, uh, ask your players, to look at their character sheets. I presume... I guess there's a presumption that we're already having a dialogue back and forth. Forsaken, you want a monster too? Okay. Um, and... Matt, Matt, making sheets. There we go, asked Wild. Matty Meister. <laughs> Selling minis. So for a second, this one's going to be yours that I'm popping open here. Um, there we go. And here's the first character we made, Atrabash. Background, Outlander was a pilgrim, a champion fighter, male drow, who, as we were going through and making his personality, you know, we were saying... Um, well, he does what he thinks is good, and he definitely comes across as this neutral evil character, but he's he's not doing things like, yes, I'm a villain, ah, kick all the puppies and burn down the orphanages. And even as I said that, you know, we brought up the fact that given uh, who he is and what he does, he might not do it just, just for the sake of being evil or some two-bit villain. Uh, he is doing it, uh, or his evil acts are to actually try and strengthen someone. To make them stronger, and he takes responsibility. Uh, you know, so he might kill, uh, he might kill someone's parents, but then he'll adopt the kid and teach him how to fight, and help make him a stronger person in the world. It doesn't necessarily make him neutral. I mean, you you've murdered someone's parents, but um, he's still going through, and he is, uh, he has these ideals that he's still following. So, as we take a look, right? I once ran 25 miles without stopping to warn my clan of an approaching whatever horde. A flump horde. He's from the Underdark. There was a horde of flumps that were coming to savage his village. Um, I'd do it again if I had to. I'm driven by a wanderlust that led me away from home. Uh, greater good. It's each person's responsibility to make uh, the most happiness for the whole tribe. I suffer awful visions of coming disaster and will do anything to prevent it. And don't expect me to save those who can't save themselves. It is nature's way that the strong thrive and the weak perish. Yeah. <laughs> we are here to educate you with our flumpheric culture. <laughs> Call them off. It's not worth it. <laughs> and hey, Diadems, welcome. Uh, Diadems, uh, Daily has sponsored a raffle. Actually, I better put a notice up on our Discord about that. But uh, Daily has sponsored a raffle for two boxes to be held a little bit later here. Uh, so actually, let's put this up here. Uh, at Daily has sponsored two boxes of minis for raffle uh, later tonight. Entry... Whoop. Entries will open at, eh, let's say, 12.15 a.m. Eastern. Currently 11.36 p.m. as of this post. And the names will be drawn at 12.30. Winners can pick one mini of their choice from the box and 
postage to a domestic address is included. We begin Forsaken with a Sahagin. With active camo, it seems. If only they did this on your tabletop, right? After that, we are going right into the uncommons again. A hobgoblin with a sword and shield. Next up, we have a stone golem. Or lastly, and I'm going to make sure here, let's put Forsaken on your box here. Or lastly, we have an ultra rare figure in the box. And that figure is an invisible elf fighter. Warhammer, shield, heavy armor. So again, you can prime this and paint it yourself. You can use it in stealth mode or if the invisibility uh, spell is cast on your mini. And if you want to see what the regular one looks like, it is up here. I'll take it. Uh, Forsaken, which one specifically? Which one do you want to take? All right, the invisible figure, got it. And thank you very much for sponsoring for sponsoring that. So that leaves one box of MM2 and two boxes of MM1 that are left. 3, I should say. There's there's technically here I'll put this one underneath, and there we go. So that's what I have left. Uh, and whatever two are, uh, you know, if we get down to two left, those are going to have to be on reserve for the raffle. So if we look over here, um, we have uh, Atrabash. Um, opposes a horde of whatever X creatures. Uh, or uh, another tribe. It could even be, look, he's a drow. This is house-to-house -house warfare we could even uh, uh, go in. So if he learned of a plot that another drow house was looking to, to take his down, he could have run 25 miles through the Underdark to warn uh, his own clan. You know, he may be a male in this in this matriarchal so uh, society, but, you know, he'll, he's still going to fight and survive. And in fact, maybe that's what led him to be an outlander. Uh, something happened and, and he, you know, he just left. Maybe that's what detached him from his house is his house was defeated. And so he just went around. And he said, you know what? I have to be stronger. Opposes uh, a horde of X that uh, ruined his house. Um, and, oh, and so he suffers these visions of a, of a coming disaster. Uh... Coming disaster related. Hey, this is this is campaign fodder. Must be stronger, and to rebuild uh, a house of his own. Pilgrim. That is his pilgrimage. So now let's go to Jurad. Cleric, Tempest, Guild, Artisan, Locksmith. 
And when we were building this character, he had something similar happen. Aha, we're, you see how we're finding some bonds um, in between our characters. Now, there's a separate exercise that we undergo where we, where we link these commonalities uh, in order to make an actual campaign. We're not doing that just yet. We want to extract information for NPCs and villains. But by the end of the week, we will definitely be making a campaign outline for all of this. And as we were forming his personality, right? If we look over here um, and we're talking about it. Well, how do you have a locksmith that is a, a, a Tempest cleric? Aha, he's channeling his electrical powers. Maybe he discovered, he might not know what electromagnetism is, but maybe he discovered this first, uh, you know, an electromagnetic way to make a lock because locks are in his mind um, because everyone tried to hide in his, uh, in his people's uh, church or, you know, some sort of a temple. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be impregnable and uh, the locks busted and the, everyone inside was killed by this uh, invading horde or something. And, uh, and he vowed after surviving that, I will make a lock that just cannot be undone. And so now by using electromagnetism, even lockpicks won't work because that can't conduct the electricity needed to activate or deactivate what we're calling storm locks which is his special brand of lock that uh, he has invented and that he wants to sell to people. He wants to go out and have everyone have storm locks, not just because it'll make him wealthy, but because it will protect people. So he's rude to people who lack his commitment to hard work and fair play. I mean, look, he's paid his dues and I just don't mean his, uh, his, gil his monthly guild fees. I don't part with my money easily and will be ha and will hagg haggle tirelessly to get the best deal possible. Aspiration. I work hard to be the best there is at my craft. So, um, desperate to sell his storm locks, um, not just for profit, but safety. Uh, in a way, he's uh, seeking um, sort of um, indirect forgiveness for something he technically didn't do, right? He didn't let the monsters in. He was a kid at the time. But he still feels guilty, right? He has survivor's guilt. And so this is his way of paying penance. Not only by channeling the power of his storms in, in fury and assault, but also by channeling his faith and his devotion and his passion to help people uh, through his craft. I'll get revenge on the evil forces that destroyed my place of business and ruined my livelihood. Revenge on the evildoers that destroyed... His, I will just say his past. Uh-oh. So, there's a horde. There's something else. You see... Hey, Astraeus, welcome! So, you see how this is... Uh, um, you see how this is building into ideas? And, and again, if this were live players, and we're, we're having to pretend we have live, live players as a DM that are submitting these character sheets to us, and we're taking a look, they're building a story for us already. I'm never satisfied with what I have. I always want more, right? So that's why... So maybe not. he's not necessarily desperate, uh, but he is He is um, obsessive. Obsessive to sell his storm locks. Now we have Rizguru. And this was the multi-class character that we made. Uh, who is a divination wizard and devotion paladin, or as Fluffy Sheep condensed it, a uh, div uh, divo divination. Uh, he he mer he married the two words together uh, in a really unique fashion. Wizard divination. Paladin, Devotion, Urchin. Now, her story that we developed was, right, so we have this uh, female half-orc 
She was living out on the streets. Uh, she was very, I mean, she was desperate. Um, she, you know, trust issues. She lost her parents. Uh, probably didn't already have a, have a good life growing up anyway because of her mixed blood. And, um... A, as we're making her character, we said, all right, so these wizards took her in and said, uh, you know what? Uh, we're going to give you a scholarship. Number one, you're going to play for like our football team, right? You're, you're big, you're beefy, you need help, and also we're going to give you an education. You're going to work for us, and you're going to study under us, and then you're also going to play some sports. Um, and so they adopted her in, and she was very grateful. Um, you know, look, learn, learning to become a level two wizard is a significant feat. I mean, this already sets her above. Obviously, if this campaign was level 5 or something, or 6, we'd scale her up appropriately. But as we generated her, even being a level 2 wizard puts you ahead of a lot of other people. Um, and so, um, after that point, because of the background uh, features up here that we're going to touch on, uh, one of her uh, a sort of adopted professors or her mentor uh, was killed or kidnapped or something had happened. And she tried using her divination magic to find him and couldn't. And thus she was determined and said, you know what? There's just some things magic can't do. You have to do it yourself, right? That's what I learned when I was playing sports. And, and that's even what a lot of the wizards or even specifically my mentor, uh, maybe he was a really cool guy saying, look, we're going to teach you magic, but ultimately it's an extension of you. And so with this faith, with this devotion, right? With this devotion to the people who took her in, uh, and this exposure to magic having maybe opened up her channels and creatively thinking about how to apply herself, she set out in order to try and find her missing mentor. Oh, a divination wizard. Uh, uh, it was something along those lines, I think, that Fluffy Sheep was talking about, right? A wizard of divine oaths. That's that's kind of like the, the Mystic Thurge uh, from 3rd uh, Edition. So she likes to squeeze into small places where no one else can get to her, and she asks a lot of questions. Well, hey, that's wonderful for someone who's learning to become a wizard. People, I help the people who help me. That's what keeps us alive. So, helpful, inquisitive. I owe a debt that can never that I can never repay to the person who took pity on me. Owes a debt. Compelled action from that I will never fully trust uh, anyone other than myself right this is what's making her so determined she likes her mentor she probably likes you know, all the wizards and you know what she probably has like a, a clique of, uh, of girls who are like oh you know look at uh, you know maybe maybe uh, Rizguru here is uh, is sort of like the, the orc, orc named Becky you know like oh well look at Becky over there just thinking that she's you know, just because she was adopted and given a scholarship doesn't mean she's a wizard. You know, just think of all the school stuff that you've been through in middle school, high school, you know, Harry Potter sort of social finagling and whatever. And so, you know, she may she may be thankful for what she has, but she'll never fully trust anyone other than herself. And that's what led to this. Yeah, this rock on. Like, so she has a strong personality and uh, not that we don't have other strong personalities, uh, but for sure, I, I would see her as a, a leader type in this party from what we've uh, gone over again. Uh, so from this, we extrapolated. Uh, she has a missing or dead mentor or other, other debt as above next up we come over to Sarge uh, who when I was posting up the links which by the way remember everything we do well almost everything like, there's some free periods that I, I don't uh, put up um, a lot of the content that we do ends up here in past content and so if you want to see these characters be made Boom. Rizguru Orkenfowl Zamoga. Here's a here's a blurb. Here's a personality little fun fact. And then you can watch her be made here. As well, you can download her character sheet yourself if you like her and you want to use her as an NPC or as a model for a PC. It's right here for you.
Uh, and so Sarge, uh, I, oh, I minimized it here. Uh, when I was going through, I named him Sergei Lumlivian. And I did so uh, as he has uh, a human and, elf and elven halves. Not, not, well, not like dragon half. Anyone? Dragon half? I, I guess I'm dating myself again here with, uh, with that anime. So we have Sergei, who is a warlock, uh, Feyblade. Remember, this was all completely, uh, this is gener uh, random, randomly generated. A soldier who is a quarter master. So already we have a soldier, there's an army that exists in a, in a battle of some kind that's occurred. And we were going through his traits, right? I'm full of inspiring and cautionary tales from my military experience, relevant to almost every combat situation. And I enjoy being strong and I like breaking things. Hey, Estwell. Um, Frankenstein half-elves. Sutured right through the middle. <laughs> hey, I have a half-elf in my Thursday game that's like a, a Janus cat. He's half-elf and half-orc. But mechanically, he's a half-elf. Um, so, he's been through stuff, right? He has tails. And we said, alright, so he's chaotic neutral, because again, that was randomly generated. But he believes in the greater good. How can that be? We have a neutral we have a neutral evil character that has a greater good uh, ideal. And now we have a chaotic neutral person with a greater good. How does that work? Again, alignment... I think is an expression of your character. You can have good thoughts and be a bad guy, but the way you express your thoughts is going to leave an impression that you are evil or selfish or whatever. Um, so our lot is to lay down our lives in defense of others. And we said, well, how does this work? Right? That sounds dumb. Chaotic neutral believes in greater good. He'll sacrifice himself. And, and so we said, all right, sure. He will, he'll be the do as I say, not as I do example to the other people in the, in the military or people that he's taken uh, under training. Uh, he has scars. He has stories. He's done all the things. And he does it so that he occupies this margin of irrational behavior so that other people who are in this like, you know, safe, normal people can't enter the margin, right? Because it's, it's filled. It's blocked by him. And, and so, therefore, he's keeping people from busting through and and just sort of dissipating, right? Because they, they end up doing something really dumb and getting themselves killed. So, if he's an expert at living in that margin, he can prevent, you know, other people, right? The, 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 the rock, the foundation of this army, as many as he can, because obviously people slip through. Uh, but he can, he can be that barrier, and he can be that example. And so, it's easy to say, oh, that's crazy Sarge, and he does all that. Um, and therefore, you know, the youngins will use him as an example of, well, we probably shouldn't do that, uh, for one reason or another. I'll never forget the crushing defeat my company suffered or the enemies who dealt it. So, uh, we have someone, uh, serves as an example to others, taking risks for himself. Um, from this, we determined that he was a prisoner of war for a while. He was captured, right? And, and so maybe he did, he maybe did something dumb to try and save other people. And that's what really cemented this conviction. Uh, so he serves as an example to others, taking risks himself. Um, uh, was a, a, was a POW by this force. Same as, uh... Same as the above, right? We have two people that directly mention of uh, uh, these uh, these forces, right? Maybe it's some rabid flump. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is just some like you know insane evil uh, you know family of flumps that are just savaging people. Um, no, I mean it, it could be it could be whatever we're gonna generate next. But we have now three hard placeholders in a story for people to come together and say we really don't like this person. Or these people. And with Rizguru, it's softer because maybe her mentor is uh, captured by these people or her order is threatened by them in some way. 
My hatred of my enemies is blind and unreasoning. So, uh... Filled with hate. Um, that makes a vicious cycle of impulsive choices. And, uh, and so as we're going through this, we also said, look, he hate, he hates these people, right? He was held captive. He, it just it made him seethe, and he was so upset. And how he became a warlock was this archfey uh, who had, appro uh, had approached him, or at least sent an agent out there, right? Uh, he, he is a half-elf. He has fey ancestry. In fact, he favors his elven side more in some way, whether it's uh, language, personality, uh, or just genetically he looks more elven than human. And so this Archfey extended a deal saying, look, I, uh, and again, we just made this up on the spot from random roles. I'll free you from this place, but you owe me. And, uh, and he said, well, look, uh, what do you want me to do? I'm, uh, I, I don't have any weapons or armor. I'm, I'm, I'm helpless here. And the Archfey made, uh, made him forge this blade pact, right? So he could summon a weapon, any weapon at will. And gave him the invocation of the, the armor. So he always has armor whenever he needs it. And so with his powers, he was able to free himself. And now is owed a service to this Archfey. All while nursing this, uh, this you know, unreasoning hatred for these people. And so he probably finds ways to kind of straddle the fence between serving the Archfey. And hunting down the people who captured him. And probably killed his friends or family if not in, in a context of war or invasion, but um, of his troops, right? He was a quartermaster. He ran the camp. He ran the bivouacs. Uh, you know, he was the one doing the accounting of supplies, you know, making sure people were uh, digging latrines, uh, you know, a certain a certain distance from camp and a certain, uh, you know, far, uh, far apart. He was a manager of a military camp. He knew people. He knew what they wore, what they liked. He talked to them all the time. He could have even been like the paymaster and those people they're not coming back and so he has this hatred in his heart but he also doesn't want the younger generation to fall into the same things that he has done are these characters compelling to you i, I mean if you were here while we made them hopefully they were but now that you're getting a recap are you getting into this I hope that this is empowering to you all. I hope that this is, again, this is completely randomly generated. You ha you don't need any experience with D&D. We haven't even really talked mechanics of D&D. We've talked about some concepts, but that can be applied to a lot of other fantasy. Or just storytelling in general, right? You want stuff for NaNoWriMo? Bada boom! Hey, forget about it! It's right here for you. What's the matter you? <laughs> That's where wise guys go and uh, learn their trade. What's the matter, you? <laughs> All right, and then lastly, we have Dagby, who is a sorcerer, wild magic hermit. Number six. Now, class, open your PHBs to Chapter 4, and we're going to go to the letter H for Hermit. Number six is, I needed to commune with nature far from civilization. So, she she was a, a, a self-exile. She felt compelled to go and, and, leave, uh, and leave the world behind. You know, just... Dance your cares away. Save your worries for another day. Let the music play. Down in Fraggle Rock. Down in Fraggle Rock. Nobody, we needed books to teach. <laughs> oh man, I meant to go to bed at a decent time last night, but I was like, let me just draw a few, or do a few words. Around 4.30 a.m., I fell asleep in my chair. Oh, my gosh. Hey, that's a, that, that's old Minecraft syndrome. One more block, one more block, one more block. That's that's really good, though, Dark Wolf. Uh, I'm good on you for, uh, for staying to that. All right, so she is a mountain dwarf 
who who left her her people her home in order to go commune with nature now nature could be a mountain and maybe she just said you know what i'm tired from being underneath it i want to go to the top i want to go to the tippy top or i want to go into the the alpine valleys and the meadows that uh, that extend beyond uh that we never really get to see uh so again we have another chaotic neutral character uh, so she's already, you know, impulsive. Uh, she she makes decisions maybe more instantaneously. Um, and and we have sorcerer. So the magic is coming from within her. It's a part of her, right? She's a mutant. She's an X Man. It's it, it the, her, she can cast her magic uh, herself. She doesn't need a book. Um, and this wild magic again, it kind of plays into the impulsiveness. The you know what happens in life. And so we're building this character. And now what can we draw as DMs? from a player who submits this character sheet to us. We haven't talked about spells or ability scores. Again, I'll remind you. We haven't talked about their strength scores. We haven't talked about their skill proficiencies. And we can. We can take that into consideration, and we will when we do some campaign planning later. But for right now, who are our characters? I'm oblivious to etiquette and social expectations, and I often get lost in my own thoughts and contemplation becoming oblivious to my surroundings. Right? She was a hermit. She she didn't have to answer to anyone. You know, she drank water right from the mountain stream. Uh, you know, she answered nature's call as it as it would happen. Um, you know, she she might have missed out on the finer points of dwarven society or even others. Uh, you know, and and she went out there and and learned how to speak to to squirrels. You know, squeak, squeaker, squeakums. Uh, squeaker, squeakums, squeak. Uh, also, chaotic neutral, greater good. How does that happen? This is how it happens. My gifts are meant to be shared with all, not used for my own benefit. Something happened that awoke in this power inside of her. And she now needs to leave this hermitage, this self-imposed exile. In order to go back into the world and by her own reckoning just like we have with the fighter right i want to make people stronger so you take someone who's in pain and and he says i'm just gonna use your arm hurt it's only gonna slow you down <laughs> now i cut your arm off get over it kid i'm gonna bind it and i'm gonna teach you how to fight with one arm and you're gonna kill people with with two arms her her bond nothing is more important than the other members of my hermitage order or association so there, there could have been others that she met with, or that there are others that have joined in on some sort of magic circle, or how she came to know her powers. Not a druid circle, per se, but others who might have gotten... Others who might have gotten a message. Others who might have partaken in a dream. She's not the only one. She can't be the only one that has these powers. She has to find the others. And her flaw? I harbor dark, bloodthirsty thoughts that my isolation and meditation failed to quell. She has a schism inside of her. A moral one. An emotional one. Uh, a, compre like a, a comprehension uh, schism. I mean, if, if a player can manifest it as something... You know, a, a lot of times we use a, a split personality as a catch-all. And I have no problem if people want to play a character that has uh, some kind of uh, a, a developmental disability or a, a mental illness, uh, you know, because those can make very compelling characters. As long as it's not done in a way that just makes it seem cheap, right? Um... So we're making Jade. Well, huh? oh, well, she's already been made. This is a character from last week, but I, I guess in a way, right? So something happened, right? When she was communing with nature, something happened. And this is very well what could have awoken her own nature. The magic inside of her. This wild magic. This magic that she wants to help people with. But, but something bad can happen if she uses that magic. And also there's that calling. Something out there is going on. She has to help people, but from what? Every spell she casts can help people or destroy them. And at the same time, she there's a bitterness. There's this dark seed inside of her. 
that's looking to escape or get out. You know, her shadow flickers on its own from time to time. And there may be times, maybe she chalks it up to the wild magic, or the wild magic is, it is this uh, impulse made manifest, or this, you know, or this uh, mental, uh, you know, or emotional state that manifests, not just in a, a clinical diagnosis, but it actually exists. And so she attributes those impulses to that. And w so we have someone who might seem like a bit of a loose cannon. It doesn't directly say that she had some prophetic dream, but she was definitely, look, communing with nature as as per her background, uh, like her type of hermit, right? You didn't even need um, Outlander. Um, or not Outlander, uh, b because with hermit, I'm sorry, you do also get uh, discovery, right? Her discovery is what led to her sorcery and this, this schism. <laughs> discovery plays into any scenario you want as a DM. Uh, this feature has created the character and can allow for uh, what I call plot putty. Right? She can she can fill in the gaps if there is one. Or she can be a, a, a supporter or a denier of one thing or the, or the other. And yet, despite her being chaotic neutral, she still feels she has to help people. Despite her fighting against this own dark gift that is, you know, these impulses. I want to help people, though they don't deserve it. Oh, let me, uh, here, let me cast Mending. Uh, I know, uh, I know it doesn't, uh, you know, a cantrip in, in the traditional sorcery sense won't do it, but, you know, oh, l you know, here, little girl, uh, let me fix your, uh, let me fix your little, little, uh, stuffy bunny here. Fireball centered on yourself. <laughs> Take them out and then you won't have to protect anyone. Oh, but your little bunny. <laughs> no. There'll be no bunnies. You have a job to do, and this isn't it. And and you get this, you get some really cool, uh, you know, go going back and forth, some dynamic, and uh, and just a, a lot of a lot of good things here. Hey, Roxy, welcome. I should put this up too. Um, I forgot to do that. <laughs> Whoops, not one thirty. Hey, Roxy, thank you so much. Now that we have this redux of our characters, right? We boiled them down to their essence. We didn't look at their skills. We didn't look at their spell sheets. We didn't look at, at their ability scores. That's fine, and that's a part of uh, of D&D. But for what we want to do as DMs, we want to create a compelling story. If RPCs submitted these characters to us to run a story, which we probably have a seed in our mind, but let's fertilize it. Let's cultivate it. What do we have here, right? We have an and let's mix that with our setting. All right? Let's move this over and then bring up We have an isolated area. I, I kept making some jokes of John Carpenter's The Thing, right? Uh the whole thing takes place in an isolated um, you know, Antarctic uh research station. You know, so going outside of it is is very deadly, maybe only for short bursts. And everyone's contained inside with whatever is brewing. Um, so here we have something similar, right? There are these circumstances that we made that uh, are making a, a have completely habitable, uh, a nice biome in the middle of this Arctic area. But, you know, getting into or especially leaving and getting out of is tough. 
Uh, there's this uh, form of government uh, that's a confederacy that are, are several of these people that have made these stilt towns throughout this big swamp area. Uh, this big, like, thermal lake. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, um... And, and so they banded together and said, well, look, we want to re remain our own sort of stilted city-states, but let's all work together because the, the prospects of us, you know, leaving, we might have some trade, maybe only during, like, the height of summer you get a truck caravan. In fact, there's some places um, up in Alaska, I, I, if I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, DMs, uh, but there are some places uh, that uh, need to be resupplied. And truck caravans can only access them in the middle of winter when the ground is frozen over. And so for like a, a month, like one month out of the year, uh, trucks pour into these remote towns or research stations or military bases, drop off provisions and everything, and then they leave before the ground softens back up and, and the place becomes inaccessible again. Uh, and Roxy, I'm sorry, if, if I didn't answer uh, your question, how am I? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, and, and thank you again for that host. Right, so we have uh, we have a, a place that's half elf, half human. And um, either that or they're flown in, depending on the weather. Okay. I, there's a special name for those truckers, right? Are, are they, they're not over land, per se. But isn't there something... I thought there was something, like a special name for him. But yeah, um, that we're in, we're in 2018, and, and we have conditions like this. You know, it seems like a, you know, a throwback to yesteryears, but you know what? That's, that's how life is. So we have this settlement. Again, we randomly rolled it. Um, elf and human? Well, well, wouldn't you know, everybody, we have a drow who's an elf human we have a half orc so eh, maybe an outsider might might have been raised by humans or something ah but our soldier is a half elf you can presume that there's half elves living here as well and a mountain dwarf we uh, as we we're developing this place the stilt cities were presumably built on uh these these sunken ruins that dwarves still exist underneath. Perhaps they're perhaps they're Duragar, um, or they're or they could just be mountain dwarves that have adapted to this Arctic climate. You know, when when this disaster came, they just sealed themselves underground. Uh, you know, keeping the water and the cold and everything out. And wouldn't you know, they they peak up every fifty years, and and some humans and elves have made a stilt city on top of them, and that's where we ended up having this. Um, uh, ba -da 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 -da. We said uh, a cabal seized power openly. Was it the dwarves? Where the dwarves came up and said, "Look, we live down here, and you're going to follow these rules. Otherwise, things are going to happen." And so the dwarves rule, but they're really detached, right? The, actually, the dwarves are in a great position to act as this. Um, as this, uh, we're talking about the Federalist Papers. If you haven't read them and you want to know about federalism and uh and what the you know and how that's a, a kind of a confederacy i'm not talking about a civil war confederacy in in topical senses although the confederacy was just that in in the civil war but i would urge you to read the federalist papers uh because there were people who were like pro-federal government and anti-federal government having an open exchange through newspapers uh that's what people did before the internet although we're seeing a lot of that now uh, except i think people were uh, a lot more civil uh, about calling someone a, uh, we'll just say like a dum-dum instead of a, uh, you know, something that I probably shouldn't say on stream. Uh, and so the dwarves uh, came up and they're probably the ones who are actually facilitating this sort of overarching minimalist uh, umbrella or uh, this confederacy that's binding together these villages of elves and humans together. Um, because the, the dwarves don't want them to ruin things or to bring ruin. That's what sunk their original city. That sounds something that's kind of prophetic, doesn't it? We have characters who are going to go to a place following a prophecy. Hashtag just saying. And so, yeah, we went through... We went through 
so much. I, I don't want to get necessarily into the campaign ideas for the campaign outline. We're going to do that later this week. Um, but th there's a lot of prompts here that we can uh, th that we can include. But with the setting, I think that we can we can say, look, there's this place that uh, it's known for a particular good. Something happened in the past that uh, made the dwarves uh, hunker down until recently. And we have these characters who are chasing who are chasing prophecies. We have these characters who are sent out by uh, internal or external um, means, right? We have someone who owes a uh, who owes themselves to a patron, the warlock. Could be sent here for reasons that the Archfey wants something. We have Rizguru who is coming here following the trail of her uh, missing mentor or is trying to track down the people who are threatening her order. So she has an internal compulsion, whereas Sarge is following orders because, hey, that's another reason why he was picked. He's a soldier, he's good at that. He's following orders. You have Gerard. Uh, who goes? Who, who? He's a traveling salesman, right? He goes through and he wants to sell these locks. He wants to keep people safe, and so he can be out here as well. Um, you know, trying to uh, either following clues that maybe uh, have led these evil doers uh, to this location directly, or the evil doers are going to target here next, and so he's come ahead of this wave to try and help people lock themselves down against the coming storm, right? He's a Tempest Cleric, we can say that. We have a sorcerer who just wanders. She wants to help people. She has had this discovery, this vision that could bring her here to this remote place. And we have Atrabash who wants to help people be stronger and who is who could have come in with a supply caravan or who could come here having learned of this place. Heck, if he's a drow, and we're saying that the, the, the underground dwarves, if they're not mountain dwarves or something, maybe they are Duragar. Uh, maybe he found his way through the Underdark and has popped up here. He is learning what's going on and is saying, you know what, these people need to be stronger. So he's not going to sell them a monorail, but he's definitely going to uh, inflict a little bit of pain and expose weaknesses here. It won't make him popular, but he's going to argue. If you think I'm not, if you think I'm a bad guy, do you know what's behind that wall of ice or that that wall of uh, of snow and wind that you're hiding behind? Have you seen what's coming? And you call me a monster because, uh, you know, because there was a kid dying on the pier, and I put him out of his misery because the enemy won't have uh, won't have the mercy to do so, and no one was willing to step up and help him. Something along those lines. So I think that we have. Hey, Golden. Oh shoot! I'm sorry. Yeah, DMs. We got to put the the raffle up. Beep beep beep. Uh. I I got on such a speech. I got on such a speech. Thank you very much for that. gonna load all right uh 2x uh choice of mini figures uh ticket cost is gonna be zero and you can get one ticket So we're going to hit create and start. Exclamation point enter or exclamation point ticket. You don't need a number or anything. Uh, you just type that and you will be entered in. Uh, remember that uh, you'll get one one miniature of your choice from the box that you, you choose to open if you're a winner. And that um, included with this raffle is uh, domestic postage. If you live outside of the U.S., um, we're going to have to talk about... Uh, we're, we'll have to talk about that, I guess. Uh, but certainly, if you live in the U.S., you don't have to worry about it. 
Um, so you know what I'll do? Uh, so we'll keep this open for a little bit here. Why don't I get up and take a break? Uh, I think that we extracted a good amount of information. And now from this, we can start creating uh, NPCs and or villains. And uh, we'll come We'll come back. We'll, I'll have a break. We'll do the raffle. And then we'll begin our next part. And we'll crack open our Dungeon Master's Guide. So class, come on now. Make sure you have your DMGs ready for the next part. <laughs> 